We are live and recording. Yay! Hello, everyone. A very happy Tuesday. And now I'm very excited because today, as many of you know, we have a Star Wars display in our store that is curated with so much love and attention because, well, quite frankly, we love Star Wars. And today we have have Justina Ireland and we are celebrating her new book Star Wars the High Republic out of the shadows. Yay! Look, I even have a copy like a professional. <laughs> Vanna White moment, Vanna White moment for the beautiful cover. And, and Justina is going to be in conversation with Preti and let me see, it's Star Wars, The Clone Wars, I believe is the newest book you have work in. I was trying to get the right one, but I wanna make sure I-, I For the newest Star it. Wars book, uh, it's A Jedi You Will Be, which is a picture book that came out last fall. <gasps> yes, 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 thank you. Thank you, I was about update, update. And the picture books are so cute. Oh my gosh, I freaking love them so much, guys. You need Star Wars picture books in your life, so make sure you also take a look at it. But just to give you a little bit of a background on our authors, Justina enjoys dark chocolate, dark humor and is not too proud to admit that she's still afraid of the dark, which I feel you on. Uh, she lives with her husband, kid, and dog in Pennsylvania. And she is the author of Dread Nation, which chef's kiss, so happy when that one came out, Deathless Divide, Vengeance Bound, and Promise of Shadows. Her Star Wars books are Lando's Luck, Spark of the Re Resistance, and The High Republic, A Test of Courage, as well as, of course, Star Wars, The High Republic, Out of the Shadows. <laughs> and Preeti is a young adult author and freelancer. She's written for SYFY, Polygon, and the Nerds of Color, among others. She's currently living her dream come true writing characters like Spider-Man, Khan, and Yoda. And her first picture book, which we just mentioned, Star Wars, A Jedi You Will Be, is out and available to purchase. So those are the formalities. You now know a little bit more of our authors. Before I pass it on, just some house rules for everyone. If you look to the right hand side, we have our chat section. Hello to everyone saying hello back. We will be in the chats with you talking and everything. If you have a question for our authors, if you look right down below, there will be a little button that says ask a question. If you click that, you can submit a question. I highly encourage you to take advantage of that. The best part of events are that you get to interact with the authors. You get to poke and pry their brain and be like, this amazing thing that destroyed me. Why? But how you came up with this? Give me more. So make sure that you ask whatever questions you have. And then also, the most important thing you can do is to go out and purchase this amazing book. So if you look down below, there will be a purchase signed book button, which will magically take you to a page where you can purchase not just the book, but a signed copy of the book. And in addition to a signed copy, you get a really freaking cool light up pin that is really, <laughs> really fun. And I got to see in person at the store. So that is enough gabbing for me. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Priti and I will see you all at the end. Have a good event. Thank you. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm very excited about this and not just for like one very big reason for me personally, <laughs> but Star Wars The High Republic Out of the Shadows out today. So first question, how are you feeling? Um, I'm great. I'm here with my space husband over my shoulder. <laughs> I saw that and I was like, I so desperately wish I had brought my space husband with me so that he could be over my shoulder. But I he's at home packed away. <laughs> I just got him out because I just moved. And so I was like, I have to get him out because this is all your fault. In fact, you were the one who was like, look what you can get. And I was like, look what I can get indeed. So. <laughs> I appreciate that there's just like, I feel like there are like 20 of us who just immediately bought this on this printer in like the Utah. middle of the country. It's like a Utah. They're yeah. like, what? It's Everybody like, wants these. Why is everyone ordering these Timothy Oliphant? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, why not first why not right <laughs> i'm actually disappointed there are not more standees that you can order because i i was talking yesterday every time i have to put it away when i'm not doing like an event because i walk <laughs> into the room and i think there's somebody in the room I'm like ah there's a six foot <laughs> tall man in my house um and it's always it's always alarming so but yeah but when it's like but when it's like this it's like hey tim I feel like I have moral Tim. support. <laughs> I'm sorry, Cobb, Cobb. Hey, Cobb. So. I feel like interchangeable is okay for the purposes of him being in your, in your house. 
I don't care what his name is. Tim Cobb doesn't matter. <laughs> um, all right. So let's let's talk about Out of the Shadows. Uh, this is the second book. So we're, we're back with some of our favorite characters. Yay. Do you want to just give us like a, a quick like non-spoilery summary of what people can expect when they pick this one up? Sure. So um, we rejoin some of our folks from A Test of Courage and Into the Dark. Um, and we meet some new characters as well. So we start off meeting Sylvester Yarrow, who is a hauler who has kind of had a, like a terrible run of luck. Um, everything's going wrong. You know, it, it turns out that she's trying to start up her entrepreneurial pursuits in a time when there are space pirates ruining everything that. for everyone, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, we're finally, it's like, I, when I was writing this, because obviously I was writing this during the pandemic, all I could think of is like, there were so many people who were like, I'm going to finally open that restaurant I want. And then like everything got shut down. So I was like, I feel like, like still has a lot of like kindred, you know, spirits in our country. Um, so she's just trying to make her ends meet and something that shouldn't happen in hyperspace happens. She gets kicked out of hyperspace during a haul. Um, and instead of just like, and loses her, her ship, the only thing she has to her name. And instead of just going like, well, that sucks. And like sitting back. Um, she's like, no, you know what? I'm going to the government. I'm going to tell them what's happening on the frontier and they need to fix it, um, which is very much the thing no 18 year old would ever do, but <laughs> that's what Syl does. Um, and when she, while she's there, she ends up kind of getting roped in some political intrigue with our other, some of our other uh, friends, um, Vernestra Rowe and her Padawan, Imri Cantaras, um, as well as Reef and Comac Vitus. Um, so it's kind of bringing everyone back together from a lot of different um, books and previous storytelling. Um, there's a lot of kind of um, catching folks up just in case. I mean, not everybody's go going to always read this book like right behind everything else. So <laughs> um, I will say, though, if you have not read um, Rising Storm, um, you should probably read that first because it, I, I, one of, this is one of the things like, a lot of people ask me the order of reading of books. And for the most part, just if you read in release order, you're good. Um, in this case, you really need to read and release order, which is why this book came out a month after Rising Storm and Race to Crash Rock Tower. So that is the <laughs> the very long condensed version of what happens. And then there's <laughs> hyperspace and rich people and politics and um, electric cats and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all kinds of fun stuff. It's Star Wars, man. It's supposed to be fun. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of this. Um, but my first question is about a young Padawan on page 40. Nine and uh, 48 and 49, who shows up, <laughs> who's just you know hanging out in this hangar, like doling out ships to people. Uh, and and her name's Preeti. And um, is she gonna get a spin off? And I, I assume like a solo comic book, yeah, probably. it's gonna be it's gonna be Preeti and Max and Huberon. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's one of those things I always like to, to put the people who I've come in contact with. And I don't know if you remember, but when Lando's Luck came out, you were one of the first people to interview me for, mm -hmm. for Star Wars stuff. Um, and I was just like, you know, we worked together, of course, way back when we're doing Book Riot stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, you were always like so encouraging and so welcoming. And it was like one of those really like more memories of my like my first couple of books right because i was writing kids books and those are those are always a hard sell anyway mm -hmm. and so because a lot of people skip out on the, the the younger reader books and so i just remember, I was like man i like i need a name and i was like man preeti loves star wars as much as anybody and i don't have a padawan named preeti so let's put a, pre a preeti in there so, yeah <laughs> Yeah, I my heart grew like ten sizes yeah. when I it's read. Be, it. I was like, this is it's gonna be upsetting when you die, but <laughs> <laughs> some like horrible events gonna happen. But I hope I go out heroically. Yeah, you're That's like, like, what, what, you're like, what do you mean? I got hit by an asteroid. That's the worst. <laughs> but like protecting giant electric cats, I would assume. Yes, yes, <laughs> something very heroic. All right, so. One thing I really enjoyed about this book is how, like, you kind of start with all these, like, plot threads happening and slowly they start braiding together. Uh, and you have all these different POVs happening. So how did you kind of keep everything straight and how difficult was it moving from voice to voice? Voice to voice is never my problem. Uh, plot threads coming all together is always the problem. <laughs> because... 
because you never like so you know one of the things about uh like working with especially on this project is like there's a lot of coordination that has to happen right we're i'm coordinating with the other um project luminous authors mm -hmm. i'm coordinating with like the other um canon storytelling that's happening I'm, you know we we're like we're coordinating with all of the canon right or like there's so many there's so many plates that you're spinning at any given time um but mostly i always i always write a synopsis and then as soon as i start drafting the synopsis usually like falls off the cliff um yeah. because because you're like yeah this is gonna happen and then you're <laughs> writing and you're like i just wrote mm. three quarters of my synopsis in the first six chapters and now i don't know what i'm gonna do <laughs> So it's really, it's a, it's really hard um, to like actually braid up through all those things. But one of the other things that was really hard about this book is um, Cav was writing um, Rising Storm at the same time. And my book <laughs> takes place afterwards. So I had no clue what some of the things were going to happen. So it was like, I was messaging poor Cav a lot. I'm like, hey, uh, <laughs> you said this was going to happen. Did you, did you do that? Or did you? And he was like, no, nah, man, we, I couldn't do that. Cause he's going through the same thing, right? He's also got the synopsis that just got thrown off the cliff that cause he started drafting. And so it's, it's really a matter of you have to, as a writer, like one of the things I always tell like aspiring authors is like, you always have to know that the first draft is trash. Like your mm -hmm. first draft isn't going to be very good. And the first draft of this is, uh, was a stinker. I was writing it during like last <laughs> spring during the pandemic. So I was like, everything was sadness and doom <laughs> and i couldn't and like it was like you know there was it was an election year and it was oh, like God. everything and i was just like oh man i'm gonna put everything i love everything i love into this book everything i love about star wars everything i love about just like people in general and characters i'm just gonna put it all in this book and and somehow it came together in something it is a book shaped form so that was really exciting but yeah it's it is, I mean, and, and you know, because you've, you've written in Star Wars as well, it's it's always, you're just always trying to like thread that needle of, of telling a story that feels fresh and exciting, but also does honor to the canon. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really what it is just at the end of the day, that's all you can do. Uh, I see Jen Heddle, who is uh, <laughs> one of the editors over at Lucasfilm, saying it was not stinky. It, you didn't see that draft, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> it was stinky. <laughs> so you, I was going to wait to talk about this a little bit, but since you brought up canon, something that I love about Star Wars when I'm watching Star Wars and reading things is force lore. Like I'm obsessed with force lore. And there's a lot of force lore building in this book. You know, I really liked Imri's empath abilities and this kind of like explicit connection between force users who can sense things and empathy. And then there's also Vernestra's connection to the force, which is a little different. So can you talk a little bit about how you went about building and defining these different relationships to the force? Yeah, I think um, so. You know, one of the things we we talk about a lot, especially since Cav is is a theology. I don't know if you guys know this, but Kevin Scott has a degree in theology. Oh my god! Um, <laughs> and though, like that's like what his like his where he came from. Um, and so we talk a lot about faith and like what faith means. And I think faith for, for me is an incredibly personal thing. Um, I don't let's I don't necessarily talk about my faith a lot in public just because I do think it's incredibly personal. Um, and I feel like for the Jedi, it should be the same way. I think a lot of times we we look at the mysticism and like sort of the magic of the force without thinking about the greater impact mm -hmm. of being able to feel the force and about of being able to have that faith because you can feel that that larger thing around you. And um I, I think that's really kind of where I where I was going with it because I, I do think if we're dealing with Jedi, you know, one of the things that's really nice about this era is we do have a lot of Jedi. We have a lot of Jedi, a lot of Jedi. <laughs> it's like you can't go down the galaxy without <laughs> going into a Jedi. You're like filthy with Jedi. Um, but we don't necessarily, we didn't necessarily always get that. And even mm -hmm. when we have like the prequel era storytelling, we kind of only stick with a handful of Jedi. We don't get to necessarily branch off and, and meet a lot of like other folks. And so I really wanted to kind of show that one of the differences between the characters is how they connect to the force. You know, they're all part of the order. They're all Jedi. They all have a share a common goal. They all share a common belief system, but they're still individuals even within that. Because I really dislike when we have the storytelling where a group is a monolith, mm -hmm. um, even to the point where, you know, um, you know, 
all all Gamorians must be like working for huts kind of things, mm -hmm. or like all Twi'leks are like sexy, seductress dancer people. You know, it's like we need some variation in, in, in even in the species because I think for me, fiction is always a, a mirror to the, our real our own lives, our own our own feelings, our own emotional journeys, our own health mental health journeys journeys. And so when we're I'm creating characters, I really want them to have that same kind of echoing difference in those conversations. Um, and I just remember, you know, when I was like 16, 17, 18, um, I joined the army when I was 19, even, even then, like we spent so much time talking about our philosophy on things, like talking about what we thought. And then so I was like, it would make sense for a group of younger Jedi to do the same. Um, it makes sense for a group of older Jedi to do the same. Um, and those perspectives are gonna be different, right? Because you're old, as an older Jedi, you have more experience with the order, you have more experiences underneath your belt, Whereas, as you know, Reef and Vernestra and Imri, they're still new to the order. So it's gonna be a little different for them. So I just really wanted to kind of show that, not just like that idea that the, about the faith, but also about, you know, they all connect to the force and kind of see it in a different way, but it's still the force, you know, it's mm -hmm. still, it's still, you know, the thing that we've all known and loved throughout the storytelling within Star Wars. Part of the conversation in the book that's so fun is in addition to kind of those personal connections, which was fascinating, you know, just seeing how different characters interact with this thing that has been ever present in our lives, I think, um, is this idea of the force versus the order, right? Can you talk to me a little bit about that and maybe where you stand on it, like the the, the two pieces and how they connect and how they are are, are separate? Yeah, I think anyone who's in part of a large organization always has that difference between the organization itself and the goal of the organization, right? I mean, I like, like I said, I was in the army. So like, you know, the goal of the US Army is like defend the constitution. And then you meet the guy who's like, I just want to shoot people. Yep. <laughs> And you're like, where's that in the Constitution? Like, that's, that's weird. And so, and so I think it's really like important, not that the Jedi just want to go out and kill people because that would not be very Jedi-like. <laughs> um, but like, I think it's really important to distinguish that even within an organization, people have differing points of view. And mm -hmm. I think it's also, you know, we've seen what the Jedi become. <laughs> we've seen the prequel era Jedi. And I mean, they're like, okay, guys, they're... they're they got some oh man that line, you, have, you have a line in the book that's like that seems close to war and the jedi should not participate we're not soldiers and i was like oh and that was and so that was for me because like you know if you grew up in the original trilogy right like you never heard about like the jedi as 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 doing war as like as doing war what is that called as, I mean, like, <laughs> battling I mean, like, yeah doing as, war as doing war <laughs> go on go on go out fight some war um and so <laughs> i think i think when you get to like for me as a as a kid who grew up on the original trilogy when the prequels came out it was kind of alarming for me to see like because even within like the expanded universe storytelling we didn't necessarily you know the jedi were always kind of there to like defend against the sith or they were there to defend against like something bad. And so the idea of, of, a, of Jedi being like an aggressor, of a, of, as an aggressive force was always like a little, a little odd to me. Um, and I do wonder like, what would, what, would a, what would a pacifist say about that, right? And it's like, yeah, you got this laser sword that is very clearly meant to kill people, right? But like, you know, like, like it's always supposed to be like, you know, we always have that, you know, a Jedi's lightsaber is, a, is, a, is last resort, right? We don't mm -hmm. necessarily, and I, I do think, you know, especially as as um, as our world changes, as we become more interconnected with one another, for better or worse, um, I do think <laughs> we have to like think about that. Like, what is the social contract? Like, what do we owe each other? But also, you know, Jedi have to be thinking about like, what do we owe the galaxy? What do we owe each other as well? And I think, you know, we have our our Jedi who they have had a really rough year too. <laughs> like, they, like they were just like, yeah, I'm gonna study some books and I'm gonna meditate. And then like a the great disaster happens. And then they're like, okay, but that's been settled and that's fine. Now we're gonna go to this really cool fair. And then that's disaster. And then, then you know, the, uh, spoiler, I'm sorry if you have not read Rising Storm, but that was a major spoiler, there's disaster. I think it's in the synopsis, but. Um, and so I think, I just, I do think, I'm, I'm like so bad because I mean, my brain is like a soup of things. I'm like, what's a story? Oh, that's not like mass mass storytelling man yeah. that's where we are and so and i think it's just, i just think it's we have to have these conversations and if we can't have those conversations in a safe fun place like a book um 
we definitely cannot have them in the real world. <laughs> and that's really like where it, where we are. I mean, I, if you don't think Star Wars makes you, if Star Wars doesn't make you think about your own personal life and your own life and your own connections and your own relationships, um, maybe you're doing it wrong. <laughs> because, <laughs> because it really should. It's just, it's just, you know, it's, it's fun and it's great. And in, I think it's for me, it's, it's a thing that's always been in my life. It's always been there. I mean, like, I can't think of a last time. I don't know anybody who doesn't know what Star Wars is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I can just, I like, if you had a podcast that just talked about the places where Star Wars cropped up that wasn't Star Wars, I was just thinking about this today. Yeah. Like you would have, you could have an entire podcast about things, yes. right? Like, I mean, think about how many movies where they mention Star Wars or they make a Luke and Leia joke or they make an Anakin joke. Like, like you, it's just so part of our culture. So I if mean, it's- yeah. Should we start this podcast? Star <laughs> Wars, but it's Star Wars? It's not Star Wars, but know. it's Star Wars. It's like Star Wars, but not Star Wars. Not Star Wars. <laughs> And so I think it's, I just think it's, I think it's one of those things. It's like, yeah, people, we should have those conversations, but we should also be able to enjoy ourselves and have a good time. And why not do both at the same time and save some, everybody some effort. So. <laughs> no, it mm -hmm. worked really well. It allowed for the book to have this kind of these, like there were layers to it, right? Where you've got your story that's going on, which we, we're not going to discuss specifics because I want to, obviously people should go read the book. Um, but there's this like wonderful adventure and and like uh, threads of intrigue that are happening that will have ramifications, I assume, as the story continues. But then there are these like threads that are happening one layer under that and one layer under that of these conversations, uh, like theological conversations, political conversations, and one of them is so much of this book is about infrastructure, which was awesome. Like it's about like highway <laughs> building, right? And it's about like the accessibilities and the inequities that exist in that in in those systems. And it was so wonderful to read in a Star Wars book. So why was that something you wanted to include? And and what do you hope kind of that people pick up from it? I've always wondered who is responsible <laughs> for these things in the gal. I'm like, I am so like, I mean, I have like the the weirdest background, I guess. I like, you know, I was in the army and then I worked for the Department of Defense and then like I wrote a lot of policy at one point before I became a, a, a writer, um, a, like a book writer. And I've always wondered, like I always wonder about that in books. I'm always like, who was responsible for taking up the picking up the trash, right? Mm -hmm. Just think about your neighborhood. If no one comes and picks up the trash for two weeks, like it's off, it goes sideways. Like it's just, it's, it's awful. Everyone's unhappy. It smells like that's a really important function of, of a government. Um, and you know, when we're talking about, especially this time period where the Republic is actually functional, it's like, what are, what are they providing? Right? Like that was always my, my, like the question, like during the, the, the Phantom Menace, it's like, okay, so these people are attacking Naboo, but they're part of the Republic. What's the Republic providing Naboo? Right? Like, like what are they getting out of this? Mm -hmm. And so I think when we talk about, when we start talking about governments, especially if we're talking about a government in its golden age, um, it has to be functional and it has to provide these things. And that means it has to provide those things for everyone everywhere. And so there's a, there's a lot of conversations to be had about what does it mean to be part of a frontier under a government versus an inner, like the inner rim, right? Like how, how do these people see the Republic differently? You know, does everyone love the Jedi? Of course not. Not everyone's gonna love the Jedi. Not everyone loves anyone, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you if you bring up the subject of puppies, someone's gonna tell you how much they hate puppies. <laughs> you know, like how can you hate puppies? They're baby dogs. They're like I don't like dogs, <laughs> right? We've all met that person, and so I do think it's like it's really important to have those conversations and do that world building. Um, but I also like to do it like on the fly, which is one of the great things about YA is you really have to do a lot of your world building mm -hmm. as you're moving along, um, because. It's just you don't have the time to like. Yeah, sit that's and have, like, true. Have the uh, <laughs> twenty pages of discussing what the castle looks like, looking at you, George R. R. Martin. Um, <laughs> like literally any chapter, right? Like any chapter when he describes <laughs> the things, I'm just like, these are pages of the the castle. Like I get it. <laughs> like it's a castle. I can see it. Um, but like it's really fun to like to, and I just I just love. I mean, like I know like like we've kind of. Yeah, I just feel like I remember all the expanded universe were like deep with the political intrigue. Like I always feel mm -hmm. like political intrigue was such a part of Star Wars, and 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 um, I think we do short shrift not like not giving our YA novels the same kind of 
um, level of political intrigue and those, those kind of conversations as we do the adult novels. Um, because, you know, it, there, there, there's no really difference in between a, a YA novel and adult novel, except for the age of the characters and yeah. um, some, a romantic storyline is usually part of it, so. Yeah, there's, there's a thread of like kind of um, government use versus privatization, which I also like, like there's just so much happening in this book <laughs> that's like, you're, you're like, oh, there's this and there's this and there's this. And then there's also like the Star Wars like adventure part. I feel but like it, you can have it all. You can yes. have it all, creepy. Why not have it all? <laughs> but so this is a very different obviously republic and and government organization that we're used to in in the skywalker saga right yeah what was what i liked is that nothing was like good and nothing was evil right it was all shades of gray and i guess how did you balance that those parts where you have this like uber rich and like public servant, but they're they're on like a different level than maybe some of the characters whose POV were in. I think that's I think that's why it works, right? If we had mm -hmm. if Sil was super rich or if the other point of view characters weren't Jedi who are basically in this kind of public service role, um, I think it would it would become very didactic very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not really about like saying this is right or this is wrong. It's just about like, when you make a choice, there are consequences. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> those consequences impact people other than yourself. Um, and I think it's, I think especially, <laughs> I think, man, this is just such a pandemic novel. I like one day, one day I'm gonna look back on this book and be like, this is what happens when you live through a pandemic, you write this book. <laughs> because I think it's like such a conversation that we're having now without actually having, right? Mm -hmm. Even to this moment, we're having this conversation of like, what do you owe the public good? Um, and what do we owe each other? But without actually saying like, that's the conversation we're having, you know, yeah. it's like, go get vaccinated. Oh, I don't want to. Okay, then don't, now you're gonna die. And then people are like, wait, I don't want to get sick. Where am I, you know, it's just, it's just such a back and forth. And I think you have to figure that every society everywhere has had that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and if they haven't, <laughs> then they're probably like, Russia where they had serfs and they're like, who cares about the serfs? They're just, <laughs> that's <laughs> just, just their lot. Yeah, that's just their lot in life. Um, and I think if you're part of a, a government that's like, that we consider to be a golden age, we have to, we have to consider those things. Um, but also, I mean, it's Star Wars. So it's like, we can have those conversations in a way that we're like, okay, cool, enough of that. Let's go sit on a dog. <laughs> So. Well, I was like, why is that dog so shady? <laughs> it's like that dog is a colonial a colonist. Wait, what is that dog hiding? <laughs> I'm a not dog. even kidding. I was like, that dog is going to come back and be like the big bad of this book. The dog is a Sith. <laughs> it's not. I'm joking. I'm joking. It's not a Sith. It's not a Sith. No, not, a, not a spoiler. dog is not a Sith. Don't, no don't make a listicle about this. Like, yeah. that's not it. <laughs> Ten things to see the told us. Dogs are sick. Dogs but you are have sick. to. But you have cats to understand. Are, oh my god, dogs are sick and cats are cats. Can I? It's like I feel like it would be as somebody who has both. I really feel like it could be the other way around. Like I no, feel like would. cats would be sick and dogs would be Jedi. Hundred uh, percent. Um, all right. Uh, so this is more just because I'm interested in it, but I need <laughs> to know more about Lyric Schmeierland's Almanac of the Unknown. Oh my god. So this is the that little <laughs> smiley thing is always a, a nod to my husband because when we were in the army, because we were in the army together, um, we used to always joke around like somebody would do something. And if you people who are if you're a veteran, you know this, but we call this, this there's this thing in the army called the E4 Mafia. Um, and E4 is basically the rank you can the last rank you can have <laughs> before you have real responsibility um in the army and then after that you end up becoming an nco non-commissioned officer a sergeant and then you're in charge of people and so one of the things whenever we were because we were in the same unit together whenever somebody would like say like who did this who did this who was responsible we also used to joke and say oh it was Larrick schmeierland because <laughs> my husband's name is eric ireland so it was like a like a, and so i just was like what is a job i could give my husband that he'd be terrible at 
And my husband has no sense of direction, which is really funny because he was in the army. Um, and so like whenever we go somewhere, I have to like give him directions or like load it into the Google or else he gets hopelessly lost. And I mean, see places we've gone like a number of times. And so I was just like, if I make this like famous galactic cartographer, Larrick Schmeierland, that's like the funniest thing that I could do. So there's a reference to Larrick Schmeierland in um, A Test of Courage. And then there's another one in here. And I'm hoping one day I get to, I get to write the Larrick Schmeierland like <laughs> one off short story about this explorer who wanted to map the galaxy yes. and whatever ends up happening to him because spoiler, he's going to get eaten by Ewoks. Like he's <laughs> going to be, he's going to be the last person to get to Endor before like, <laughs> before, cause that's, that's my dream. That's like, that's like when everyone's like, what's your passion project? I'm like that's my passion project. <laughs> Just like an eight-page comic or something about this lyric smile and this, this guy who's like, I'm going to map the galaxy, and then gets eaten by Ewok. So. It's like somehow it's he's writing the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Like somehow there is a – we're going to find a way to do that crossover. <laughs> Yes, I just, I just, I think it's just so funny because it's like, who maps things, right? Like everyone, like, like we, like, you know, we have people who like, you know, came here and like, we're very terrible and like, you know, mapped out North America. And so it's like, who was the the guy who was like, you know what I need to do? Map the galaxy. Cause the galaxy is dangerous, y'all. Yep. <laughs> Like, like there are more things trying to eat you than than like help you. So I'm like, this guy had to be a, a little a little bananas. And so it's just, <laughs> it's just a funny thing. It's just I I've always enjoyed like the um the little Easter eggs, and I also like pulling things from other people's books and putting them in there too. So it feels like it makes the world feel like a little yeah. more lived in. Okay, really quick. So in about five minutes, I'm going to start taking questions. So make sure that you get your questions in by clicking that ask a question button. Um, what do you hope people who are reading the book take away from it? I just really hope everyone has a good time. I mean, like if you want, if you're there for like political, political intrigue and like those deeper conversations, I hope you can get that. If that's not your jam, just kind of skim over it. Um, and I just think, I, I think Star Wars is, is, is supposed to be so fun. It's fandom, right? It's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be work. Um, because if it was work, we wouldn't call it fandom, we'd call it work. Uh, and, and so I think it's, I think, you know, in the last, I would say like in the last, like, you know, 10 or so years, like fandom's gotten so fraught, no matter where you mm -hmm. are, no matter what fandom you're in. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we have to remember, um, that it's, it's about having fun. It's about making connection. It's about a shared love of something. Mm -hmm. And I think that that love is way more important than anything else. So I really just hope people have fun. Like if you hate the book, if you hate all the characters, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> it's done. I can't, I can't rewrite it. Um, and you're, you're going to see them again. So sorry again. <laughs> Maybe just skip the Justina Ireland. Maybe book. it's not for you. Yeah, um, but I think <laughs> I think if you're coming to this like with an idea, like I just want I just want I just want to spend some time with the galaxy. I just want to spend, which is how I approach everything that comes out. You know, it's like I'm not here to critique or like parse like story beats um, because that's what I do in my job, and I'm just mm -hmm. here to have fun. Um, and so that's really what it is. It's just have fun, have a good time. If you can do that, then you've got the answer to life, man. Like that's, that's life, that's the meaning of life. Show up, have fun, don't be a dick. <laughs> so. Like that shady dog. That shady dog. Um, <laughs> can you give us any hints about what is coming next? Well, the next book I wrote is a middle grade called Mission to Disaster. <laughs> so, so I feel like I that's mean, a good hint. I mean <laughs> specifically for the story that is coming. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Okay. What? Who was your favorite character to write? Um, this is always the question everyone asks, and it's honestly whoever's character I'm writing at the time. Um, I love writing Vernestra. I loved writing Reef. I think he's just such a cinnamon roll and so sweet. Um, I love I love writing Emery. I love writing Syl. I loved writing Avon. You know, in, in A Test of Courage. So like, I think it's just whoever I'm I'm writing at the time um, is just always my favorite. Uh, Nan is terrifying. <laughs> Nan, Just... is, <laughs> Nan is like every girl you met in high school who was like incredibly intense about the yep. one thing. Like for me, it was a girl who used to ride horses 
and he would like, <laughs> of course. I don't know if you've never met people who ride horses, like, like, it's not like just like I have horses and it's fun. I mean, like people who are like, no. I do dressage, like horse dancing. And like, you would ask her like, Hey, how's your horse? And she was just like, look at you. And, and then you're just like, Oh, Oh, this is like a real conversation. Like you're talking, like you're talking about a person. Um, and so I just wanted, I wanted to have somebody like that, that intensity, because I think like, you know, when we're in our teens, that is really the most intense we ever are about a thing. Right. Cause then you go to college and then you have a job yeah. and then you have family and like, and it's just like, there's other stuff, bills. Once you get a mortgage, like everything else kind of falls by the wayside. If you're just like, I just need to pay some for some, I have somewhere to live. Um, so I just wanted to bring like that intensity. And we also don't get to spend a lot of time with just like the rank and file Nile. We spend a lot mm -hmm. of time. Every time I say that, it rhymes, and I'm just like, I wasn't <laughs> the rank and file Nile. Say that six times fast. <laughs> um, and so I, it was, it's just nice to have like some check in. To, like she's just like a teenage girl, but then she's also, you know, she'll kill you. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah she's nice for most teenage girls. Terrifying. <laughs> yeah. um, one one brief, brief aside: Sills Sills, Sills Blaster. Blaster is the name of Sills Blaster is also the Hindi word for daughter. I didn't know that. That's so yeah. cool. So like I was reading it and I'd be like, her baby. <laughs> <laughs> even better. <laughs> it's I like, it's my baby. <laughs> That's Basically, awesome. I mean, she's like, where's baby? I was like, mom? <laughs> <laughs> I'm now gonna pretend like I knew that, so I could like, yeah, I know. that's right. <laughs> you should. <laughs> that's why I named that like that way. I, was um, like, I wonder if this was on purpose because it fits really well. There's a lot of things. Sometimes I bring in. Um, I because I was an Arab linguist for a number of years, and so there are a lot of things where I, I bring in uh, Arab, Arabic words for things because it's like it's not necessarily it's not, it's not a language a lot of a lot of uh, Amer uh Westerners know mm -hmm. unless you're like you immigrated here maybe. Um, and so it's not like, you know, um, everybody when I was in high school wanted to learn Japanese for some reason. I guess it was like it was everybody was in it. It's anime. anime. Yeah. And so like it's not like everyone's like, I'm going to learn Arabic um, unless you're unless you're Muslim. And then like, you know, you probably have learned some so you can read the Quran in the original language. Um, but yeah, so like every once in a while I throw something. But I never like I never. <laughs> now I'm like Hindi. Now I got to. I got to go back and see what they got there. There's there's a lot there. Um, yeah. All right. I'm going to take some questions. So you still have time to get some in if you haven't written your question in. The first one is from Georgie asking, does this take place after the Republic Fair? Yes. Okay. Then from Rachel, typically how long do you have to write these books when you're commissioned by Disney? You mentioned needing to throw away your first draft. How many drafts do you have time to write before the book is due? Do they expect a beat sheet first? Oh, very like, yeah. Ooh. Um, so I turn in a synopsis first, which is usually it's a bulleted synopsis. I don't do like, um, so we have different kinds of synopses we do. Um, if you do like television and film, they usually want you to do a one sheet, which is just one sheet of everything. For me, I just do a bulleted list. Um, I don't do a beat sheet. I don't do save the cat um, because I find it's too restrictive, um, which is why my books are really long sometimes. Because <laughs> if I did save the cat, they'd be really small. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I usually do a synopsis and then I do a, a first draft and then I try to get a second draft because I don't like to send anybody a first draft because it's usually verbal vomit. It's just like words. Um, and uh, my first drafts are pretty clean, but they're still not as, as tight as what my draft I usually turn in. Um, and the time we have to write is never enough. Never enough. Never, never enough. Never enough. Um, and I think that's really just everything. Like I have a book right now that's late. That's my book. It's for my Harper editor. And he's like, Hey, could you turn this in? I'm like, can I get more time? He's like, no, no, the time is gone. So there's never enough time. So <laughs> I'm one astounded that I feel like when I have to turn something in, I'm just like, well, the draft's done. Here you go. <laughs> like, I usually keep it, I usually keep it until I get sick of it. And then I'm like, okay. And usually Jen is like, hey, how uh, how's that, that draft looking? And I'm like, can I get one more week? And she's like, well. I, and then one of the things that's nice is because Lucasfilm Publishing is on the West Coast. So I, I get up early <laughs> like three morning. extra hours. I get three extra hours on the day it's due. I'm like, yes. yes. And then I'm always like, as long as it's in before midnight their time. It counts. It counts. It's, <laughs> it's usually on time. It's on deadline. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah. Oh, so true. Um, all right. Is there a character? Uh, this is from Jake. Is there a character from the HR era, from the High Republic era, that you haven't gotten to write yet, but you'd really want to? Um, I love Keeve. I love um, the the storytelling Cat is doing in the Marvel comic. If you guys have not picked up the Marvel comic, I think the trade comes out this summer. So that's a great time. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that because somebody's going to be like, no, it doesn't come out till next year. Time we're Wrong. Thinking, like, <laughs> It's like I don't like I don't follow release dates. I have so much work to do that I'm just usually like when things come out, it's a nice surprise. I have it on my <laughs> calendar. It gives me an alert. Um, and September, yeah. So it's such a great storytelling. The re- that relationship between Keeve and Spear. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of dysfunctional master Padawan relationships um, in Star Wars storytelling. So it's really fun to have like this really like loving, caring relationship. Um, although the Jedi probably won't use the word love because that's attachments. Um, but but I do really love that storytelling. So I I really I and I I know where all the storytelling is going for the characters. Um, so I'm really excited to. I hope at some point I get to write Keith just to, to bring her in. It just feels like there's so, some people in the chat who could. <laughs> I, I, I could probably <laughs> talk to someone about that. I know. I'm like I really wish this happens one day. <laughs> Um, all right. Within the High Republic, you've written both YA and middle grade novels. Do you approach writing for these different age groups differently? What does that process look like? And that is from Charlie. No. Um, so, like, one of the things about writing for kids is I really believe you have to write to kids the same way you would write to an adult, right, with respect and understanding. The only difference between really a middle grade book and a YA book is it's a little gentler. Um, I'm not going to show a bunch of people being massacred in a, in a middle, middle grade book. <laughs> That happens off screen. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then everybody died. died. And then everyone died. And kids are like, okay, yeah. Um, and parents are like, well, it's not violent. Um, and so I think that's really the biggest difference. Um, I always believe that, I believe mm-hmm. that middle grade and YA both have to end with a note of hope. Like, I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're younger. You, you get to go off into the world with that, that note of hope. Um, adults, you're on your own. <laughs> you're an adult. You can take it. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's, I don't really um, approach writing any differently. It's just really for a middle grade book, you have less words. Um, so the word count, it, I try to like um, make sure the story is a little, little, little tighter. Um, and then also, I mean, I still, because we still, even when we're talking about, when we talk about books, we should talk about the level of plots, right? You have an A plot, which, and then you have a B plot. And then if it's like a series, you have a C plot. And there's so many C plots. I mm-hmm. like <laughs> Plots on plots on plots. Um, and so I, for for a, a middle grade book, I try to just keep it to the A and the B plot. Um, because then sometimes if you have it, if you have like a, a C plot, kids just don't have that attention span. But yeah, and I mean, there's mostly, it's, it's <clears throat> at, at the sentence level, it's, it's pretty much the same. From Lily, Star Wars deals with a lot of meaningful themes and topics and is such a big part of our world today. What themes were most meaningful to you as you built your own place in the canon of the Star Wars universe? That's such a nice question. That is a nice question. Um, inclusivity. I think one of the things that's, that maybe um, Star Wars has kind of struggled with and a lot of fandoms have struggled with in the last few years is who gets to, to have an opinion, who gets to be welcomed mm-hmm. in the fandom. Um, as somebody who was a black woman, black girl growing up in the 80s and 90s, um, it, it could be really hard to be a fan, right? Like you always get like the stump, we would call it stump the chump, right? It's like, oh yeah, you like Star Wars, name your three favorite Jedi. And you're like, okay, <laughs> you can't name these Jedi that everybody knows, right? And like, you're just like, what, what is this? And I don't think fandom should be that way. I think we should be excited when people love the things that we love. I yeah. think we should be welcoming. I think we should like have those fun arguments about who would win in a lightsaber battle, you know, Qui-Gon or, you know, Revan or whoever, you know, you want to, to bring up. And so I, I think it's really important to, to just know that it's inclusive. It's like every heavy has a space. If you don't like this book, it's okay because there's other books. Um, if you don't like books, it's okay because there's TV shows. If you don't like TV shows, there's comics. There's something for you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find something you'll like. We'll, we'll, we'll do a sand table drawing of the Star Wars if you're interested. <laughs> and so I think it's just really that should be how all fandom should be. It should be really about being inclusive and welcoming people in. Um, from Mysterious Galaxy, <laughs> what scene or section brought you the most joy to write? Oh, okay. This is a spoiler. So there is a scene at the end um, with Jordana and Vernestra. <laughs> and it was just really fun to write because 
there's a thing that happens that is pretty much the antithesis of what a Jedi would do. Um, and it solves the problem, <laughs> but it is not necessarily. And so it was really, it's always, my favorite thing is always to take two people who are both very accomplished at their lives and other thing that they do, and but who, who come maybe approach <laughs> the problem from diametrically opposed viewpoints and then throw them in a scene together. Um, is the original <laughs> odd couple buddy cop kind of thing, right? And so that that's my favorite scene. That scene was a lot of fun to write. Uh, from Georgie, who's one of your favorite High Republic Jedi created by one of the other authors and one of your own? Um, definitely Keeve. And of course, Fernestra. She's she's my she's my homage to every kid who was in the gifted program or the and like got to out of, graduate high school and was like, okay, now what do I do? Because now I'm like just... <laughs> such I... big gifted energy coming from her. She's like, I'm special. I'm gonna do it. And then you get to the end. You're like, wait. Now we're all at the same level in college. Like, <laughs> we're starting. All, we're all starting. Did it matter? Did it matter? Like, like, did, like just the, the like. Do I get a good grade on this energy on like everything? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I get an A, right? And you're like, yeah. there are no grades. There yes. are no grades anymore. No grades. Nobody cares. <laughs> no. Did you survive? You get an yeah. A. <laughs> yeah. That was the only the only test there was. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, from Rachel, when you're writing a Star Wars book, is it hard to keep the lore straight? Do they give you a reference sheet as you're writing or do you do the research on your own or pull knowledge? And, and during editing, does a Star Wars expert double check the world facts? <laughs> Yes. Oh yeah, we have a whole yep. <laughs> yes, there's a whole group, <laughs> and they're called story group, and they check your facts. But yeah, I do a lot of um, I do a lot of checking in. Um, Cav, I, I usually get, uh, message Cav just because um, we're usually working on. I think both of us have been writing kind of the most like different things, and like we're also doing the um, Titan short stories, um, kind of leapfrogging each other. So I usually check with Cav and like, hey, have you it's, have you used this? Have you seen this? Did you use something like this? Um, and then I also have, like, you can't see on the shelf behind me, but there are, I mean, there's also like, you know, Star Wars toys up there. Um, but like, there's also like several Star Wars, like visual encyclopedias. Like there's one, it's like Star Wars made easy. And um, I think that, I think Mike sent that, to Michael Siglain sent it to us, like one of the first like gifts of books we got when we started this. And then my husband was like, uh-oh. <laughs> He's like, they know you. I'm like, shut up. Like, <laughs> um, and so like, I have a bunch of books, and then um, sometimes it's just about like going and watching like the movies and stuff again, and going, ooh, I wonder what kind of what species is that person in the background that we don't like really see. Like, I like I love Rogue One, um, so <laughs> like I'm like the only person. Everyone's like, what's your favorite? No, like, Rogue top One? three movies. Yes, Rogue One, top. Three. Everyone's always like, it's so sad. I'm like, but no, it's so it's good. So good. Um, but the guy Gorian in, in Rogue One, right? He's walking around like, but he's just like got this giant like, <laughs> gun, and he's just like walking around this big furry, like not looky. And that's why this guy Gorin's in uh, the book because I'm like, why don't we see these guys? Are so cool. I got these vocalizers. Awesome, big shaggy. So I have a question that's like semi-related because I'm I'm doing a series right now that is for an IP that I can't talk about, but something <laughs> happened in the narrative because it's. It's different writing books versus writing something that's visual, right? Mm -hmm. And there are internalities that sometimes you have to deal with that have never been discussed about. So what is something that you were writing in Star Wars that you realized that you were like, I don't know how this works. Like, I don't, I need to know how this, this species works or this like spaceship works or whatever it is. Oh, this is really easy. Um, <clears throat> in A Test of Courage, there's a point where I think Vernestra, oh, it actually was in here. It's in, there's a, a point where Vernestra, um, uh, gets a little like shrapnel across her cheek and is bleeding. And I was like, do Mary Allen's bleed red? Like, yes. <laughs> like, like what color what? is her blood? Like, I don't, I don't know. And so like, usually in, in a first draft, there'll be like, blah, 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 brackets. Do Mary Allen's bleed red? What is this? I don't know. <laughs> and then it's like, blah, blah, blah. And then also, you know, it seems weird when you have a Padawan calling a Jedi Knight master, right? But mm -hmm. it's still their master. And so I would always be like brackets. I'm like, this is master, right? This is the right reference. I'm like, I don't know. Because at some point your brain is like, I don't know Star Wars. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're like trying to write. Yeah. And so I always just put brackets in there, which is nice. I think that's, it's like one of those things. It's like, I don't need to worry about it right now. I'll come back to it later. I just, I always think it's funny. Like I had a character once that I was like, does this character have bones? <laughs> I don't know. It's like... <laughs> 
There's like a joke, uh, there's a joke in a test of courage about Mon Calamari you think it's like rude to sneeze or something like that. And somebody emailed me, they're like, where did you find your Mon Calamari? Oh my God. <laughs> like, like, I'm like, there, I mean, it's okay. I don't, I don't know how to get to this email. I'm like, thanks for writing. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> It's always yeah. it's just a little weird. Like, I mean, I love how people are like very possessive of like the things that they love, but it's like a Wookiee would never be a Jedi. I'm like, have you talked to a Wookiee? Maybe he wants to be a Jedi. Buryak is doing just fine, thanks. Listen, um, there's a rule about absolutes in Star Wars. Okay? Right. Like, yeah, what is that? What is it? Say? <laughs> what Only is this? <laughs> believe in absolutes. Is that the Obi Wan quote? Only a Sith believes in absolutes. <laughs> Oh, Obi-Wan, I love you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's something, though, that we, like, I think in Star Wars that is kind of unique to Star Wars in terms of just how intensely people know it. And when you're writing a story that not, nothing's going to retcon, but it does, in, in a way that I think Star Wars is really interesting in doing, shift canon, right? It can shift canon based on what you write. Like, how does that feel? I think it's I think it's good to build the world bigger, right? I think I think we want more options. I think we want to give our characters more opportunities. We don't want to narrow the focus because I think I think what happens, um, anybody who's watched a season of a TV show and like, man, that first season is so great, and then you get to season two and you're like, what happened? <laughs> because they're just doing the same thing over again and they're keeping the world focus narrow. I think that's when you start to like run into problems. I think one of the things George Lucas was really smart about was you know, you you watch A New Hope and there's so many things that are like said but never followed up on that you're like, yep, yep. Oh, what do they what do they mean? There's by so that? much room. Yeah. And I think leaving room for other storytelling is really always the way to go. Um, I think that's why Star Wars has been around for so long. I think that's why people love it so much, is because there's always room for new storytelling. Um, I think that's our time because I think Mysterious Galaxy is going to come back and, and tell everybody <laughs> how to buy books buy and books. what they can do. But there's a big button right underneath us that says buy books. So. Buy books. Buy books. <laughs> and as is summoned, I shall appear. So, <laughs> this is time for the event, unfortunately, because the two of you are such an absolute joy to get to hear speak so i'm like no give us more, more. <laughs> um i want to thank you so much justina for spending time with us on your release day Huzzah! and thank you so much to pretty for all of the amazing questions and just like we couldn't have asked for a better pairing um for today's event so just great thank, thank you so, so much, much. Yeah. And also to to everyone in the audience for coming in with the killer yes. questions. Thank mm -hmm. you for all of your great questions and just for all of the enthusiasm and Star Wars love. And speaking of Star Wars love, now I get to do the bookseller thing. <laughs> if you want to purchase Justina's new Star Wars book, which I would highly encourage you to do out of the shadows, will now be available down below. And just as a reminder, you can get not only a signed copy, which is a bit of a unicorn in these times that we now have, <laughs> you could also get a ridiculously fun and magical light up pin that will just make you feel like the snazziest human being in the world while you're reading your new Star Wars book. So on that note, thank you so much for joining us. Have a lovely rest of your evening, everyone. And we will see you all next time. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.